First of all, thank you guys for being here. It's always a danger to be the first speaker after lunch for two reasons. Number one, there's that famous afternoon food coma. And second of all, I don't want to make you sick. So um, if anybody feels nauseous, you know, get those airline bags or please step outside. Do not curl on your neighbor. That wouldn't be cool today. So, hey, first of all, I want to thank you guys. Uh, again, my name is Morgan Wright. I came out here from Virginia um, yesterday. Um, left my house at 9 o'clock yesterday morning. Went to the airport, Dulles Airport, out there at 10. Sat on the runway until 2.30 or 3 o'clock, flew into Chicago. Sat there until 9 o'clock, um, where we finally were able to fly into um, Sioux Falls here. Sat on the runway for another 30 minutes. Took another 45 minutes to get my luggage. I got here to the hotel at 1 o'clock this morning, in bed by 1.30. You know, got up, worked out, ironed my stuff. Just I, The only reason I tell you that is actually indifferent about being here today. I wasn't sure I wanted to do that, but I decided, okay, since I'm here, let's have a little fun. Okay, I'm supposed to be funnier than that. You guys can do that. <laughs> there will be tests. I have very, I have neat stuff in throughout this presentation, so you're gonna have to watch. First of all, let's start off with a quick test. Anybody know who that represents? Guy Fawkes. Actually, we've got two tests. It represents an omelet. It was actually Guy Fox. All right, what's the what's the famous date with Guy Fox? Fifth of November. Remember, remember the fifth of November, and that actually factors into a lot of the hacks that have happened with the government. Anybody know whose that is? Ha ha. Charles Ponzi. That's the original inventor of the Ponzi scheme, right? So hackers, scammers, and thieves, so we'll talk about some of that stuff here too. So let's talk about the first thing, preparing for war. You are at war with hackers and scammers and thieves. Whether you want to be there at war with you, they're attacking you. I'm going to show you some, uh, some statistics, some updated slides, talk to you a little bit about the things that I've seen. Um, in some of the testimony before Congress around healthcare.gov, we also talk about all the businesses that work with them around that. And we've looked at uh, some of the things that are coming out where, I mean, you'll see some language now, some, I'm an advisor to the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. They're actually changing some of the language. Because let me actually just ask you guys a real question. How many, how many folks in here are government, work for the government? Okay. How many here are private sector? University. All right. In the federal government, how tough is it to actually fire somebody at a senior level? Very tough, right? So you'll see the language change. Actually, it went to what they call markup yesterday. I was a part of this because on healthcare.gov, I hammered them about accountability. So you will now see language, probably won't pass, but where they're talking about holding the agency heads accountable for the performance and not just the How do you hold an agency accountable? Do I go in? Do I arrest the building of OPM? I mean, what do I do? Put handcuffs around it? Surround it until it gives up? I'm not sure. So you have to hold agency heads accountable. So you are at war with hackers, scammers, and thieves. It is about responsibility, accountability, authority. I'm going to talk to you about some of these things. Uh, so this is what it is. You guys, I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. What's your name? Ed, is that your real name? Okay, Ed. All right, just check it. All right, did you ever see the movie The Three All right, what were the three most important things that Spartan went to war with? Oh, that's pretty good because I had the picture up there just in case you got confused, right? So, what are the two things that a Spartan warrior could lose and still be okay in battle? That's right, helmet and the spear. Why could he not lose the shield? Protects the person to his left, it protects the person to his right, it protects the person behind him. So part of this thing that we see today, I'm going to talk about how to raise your shields, how to keep your shields up. You have to be comfortable with the fact that you're going to get attacked. You have to be comfortable with the fact that you're going to get breached. you got to quit building these walls. We're going to build a really high wall. It's not how high your wall is, it's how fast your fire department is. doesn't matter, I'm not telling you anymore, we've spent way too much money on trying to build tall walls. It doesn't work. What you have to do is figure out how do we respond faster. So what I want to talk to you today is actually, uh, there was a story that actually relates to this. It's about this guy who moved from New York out to the hinterlands. Um, you know, he had this New York attitude and everything, and then he moved out to kind of like the middle of nowhere, and people didn't know how to take him. And you guys think I'm talking about Lillingham, or I was actually talking about Joe Galliano. <laughs> Joe, by the way, just as you guys know, Joe was my neighbor for years in Virginia. He lived two doors down from me. But when Joe moved out to South Dakota, I said, you guys have no idea what you're getting. Right? Hey, you, come here. Sound like, you know, so I wasn't sure who actually worked for the mafia, whether it was him or Joe. There are a lot of similarities there. I don't know. We'll have to talk about this, right? So let's talk about five things. What's the first thing I want to talk to you about? One in five businesses will be the victim of cybercrime this year. Small businesses. There are 28 million small businesses in the United States. Out of those 28, one out of five, that means 5.6 million are going to get hit this year. Out of those 5.6 million, 3.4 million are going to go out of business. 60% of small businesses, 
that are intact will be out of business within six months. Do you know why? Can't, can't, can't afford the cost of the attack. So let's talk about what, what do small businesses make? Because this is what happens when they go out of business. Small businesses, the average small business profit is $38,000 a year. I mean, that's the average cost of an attack, I should say, sorry. The average small business, 57% of those make less than $25,000 a year. Uh, 70 or 93% make less than $250,000 a year. And when you look at the Ponymon Institute surveys and they talk about the average cost of a data breach, the bigger ones, you're over $7 million on the average cost of a data breach. Unless you got $7 million laying around, um, maybe we, well, I'm going to talk to you about some things. I know that you guys have gotten a lot of technical stuff. This is not a technical presentation, so I don't want to disappoint you, number one. Number two, I don't want to put you to sleep you know, right after lunch. So I will not be able to say, if I hear a head, but i got to tell you this, if I hear a head hit a table and a plate, we are going to make fun of you. I'm going to Facebook this. We're going to be merciless, <laughs> right, Will? You're, you're my Facebook guy. Anybody does that? It's up to you, all right? All right, watch out for Will. <laughs> Why does this happen? Because you don't know, you don't care, or you're willing to roll the dice, and it's Vegas, baby. You're willing to take the chance that somebody else is going to get hit and not you. How many of you guys think that's true? I see some, I see some heads nodding. Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand and be totally complicit, but you guys know it, and I know it, and the American people know it. It's the political season, so I had to throw that in, right? So uh, we know that a lot of people hope that they never get hit, so they don't spend the money that they should. They don't take the steps that they should, because it's too hard, it's too tough. Well, you can call the ambulance on that one because if you don't do these things, here's what's going to happen to you. <coughs> Trojan horse. Great Trojan horse, right? Everybody knows that story. You know, they were able to sneak it in. Let's talk about that for a minute. This is Sun Tzu. Very good saying. All warfare is based on deception. I'm telling you, I've been in Turkey. I've been in Pakistan. I've been in Colombia. Doing some work with the government there. Um, throughout the United Arab Emirates. Spent some time in the military, along with law enforcement, the intelligence community. It's all about deception. One of the greatest deceptions, actually, was World War II. The greatest deception ever won was before D-Day. And one of the things they did is uh, George Patton was in charge of a Phantom Brigade in London. They had a guy, a guy they turned into a major, whose body washed up on shore in Spain. Had all these plans where they thought they were going to land at uh, Pays de Calais as opposed to Normandy. So this, the entire, the entire Normandy invasion was based on deception. The reason I tell you that is we, we tend to lose our view of history, our perspective of history, and we become victims to, guess what, deception over and over and over again. I, was do, I do a lot of stuff for Fox News, Fox Business, Sirius XM. I'm um, their chief technology guy on a lot of these. I do ones and zeros, not R's and D's, so don't send me hate tweets. I was really crushed. I got a hate tweet one time. I said that it was about net neutrality. I mean, if somebody called me an F word, and I said, dude, that's, it's ones and zeros. I mean, God, I'm... But I arrived. Once you get a hate tweet, you arrive, right? So let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> One of the most popular ways to do it is what? Fishing, right? So what's fishing? Fishing is this. Fishing is you throw your hook in there. You know that there's fish in the pond, but you're throwing out some tantalizing bait, and you hope people do that. They hope some of those bite off on it, right? That's not the one I'm worried about. However, though, I was asked, coming into 2016, we're doing a segment. They say, well, tell us, what's your prediction for 2016 in the state of cybersecurity? I said, we will continue to do the same stupid things we did in 2015. <laughs> Click on links we shouldn't. Download files we shouldn't. Plug in USBs we shouldn't. You know, um, respond to emails that we shouldn't. You know, uh, am I hitting home with anybody yet? What, what, what are you on your head? So what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, oh, I didn't do anything. I see you admit you're done. <laughs> Okay. Oh, by the way, one of the things I used to teach was I, I used to teach interview and interrogation behavior analysis, so I taught out at the NSA to the guys who ran all the polygraphs, the Oliver James case. So we're going to have a little fun today. you mind that? Are you sure? Okay. Do you cry? <laughs> we'll see. Here's one I'm really worried about, though, is spearfishing. Why am I worried about spearfishing? I did a presentation down at the Dallas Country Club. <coughs> You know, by the way, the app, just to get into the Dallas Country Club as a member is $125,000. And then you've got to pay so much per month. So, I mean, I snuck in um, to do the presentation. Because there was no way I was going to anyway. I was a guest. But, so we were talking about spearfishing. And um, a guy in the audience says, hey, I just recently got hacked, and I, I don't understand how. I asked him a very simple question. How many people here are on LinkedIn? Come on, be honest. How many people are on LinkedIn, right? How many of you people have your job titles on LinkedIn? How many people have the name of the company you're working for on LinkedIn? How many people have your official company email on LinkedIn? So do you understand when this guy got a specially crafted phishing email that says, hey, Bob, really love the work you're doing at Company X. By the way, we kind of do the same thing. Hey, here's a little brochure we have. What's the brochure? It's a PDF. What's inside the PDF? 
malware. That's a spear phishing attack. Now, the longer spear phishing attacks, and I'm going to show you a video clip later of the morons at the office, of, and I say that, morons at the Office of Personnel and Management. We're going to talk about the security clearance debacle. Um, oh. Anyway, so let's talk about that for a second. I had a chance to interview the world's most famous hacker, according to him. You guys saw that earlier. I saw the presentation. We were talking about Kevin Bennett, you know, the zero-day stuff. Actually, I've known Kevin for quite a while. Two of the guys I trained back, you know, in the very early 90s, two of the Secret Service agents were two of the people involved in arresting Kevin uh, when he was on the FBI 10, top 10 most wanted list. Um, but so I interviewed him, but I, what I want you to listen to is it's going to be a short clip of about two minutes. I want you to listen to what he says is the number one thing he would do. Let's talk about what we said was the biggest threat facing everybody right now, spear phishing. And so I kind of want to mix this up a little bit, but let's kind of get a hacker's view of this. Let's start, you know, Kevin, we kind of talk about this. If you could only, if, if you could come back now 20 years later and you were yourself 20 years ago, but you could only pick one technology tool, you know, one tactic like that, what would it be and why? It would be social engineering because it's really difficult for to protect the human element, and it's the easiest way in, and corporations have a very difficult time defending against these types. Oh, well, let's talk about what we said was about the that. biggest threat facing everybody right now, spear phishing. And so I kind of want to mix this up a little bit, but let's kind of get a hacker's view of this. Let's start, you know, Kevin, we kind of talk about this. If you could only, if, if you could come back now 20 years later, and you were yourself 20 years ago, but you could only pick one technology tool, you know, one tactic like that, what would it be and why? would be social engineering because it's really difficult for to protect the human element and it's the easiest way in and corporations have a very difficult time defending against these types of attacks and it's extremely successful. In fact, I do penetration testing for a living. Companies hire me to break in and when they allow Listen the to social engineering and scope of the test, 100% success rate. Let's, let's make sure we define a couple terms. Number one, spear phishing. So let's talk about what is spear phishing, and then let's talk about social engineering to make sure we baseline this. So what's your view? What's your thought about the devil? Well, well, social engineering is using manipulation, deception, and influence to get a target to comply with a request. It's, that's as simple as that. When you're talking about phishing is when you're kind of blasting out a, like for example, email to an entire organization and just getting somebody to click a link, open up an attachment or something like that. Spear phishing is very meticulous. This is where you're doing information reconnaissance. You're learning about the company. You're learning about the people. You're looking at trust relationships. You're looking for, you know, partners, suppliers, customers, vendors, uh, and then you go in and you target somebody within the organization. Maybe start a dialogue, develop rapport, and then at a point you send the payload. The payload could be a word document that has a macro. It could be a link to a site that pops up a Java applet. So when somebody clicks on that Java applet, they get in. It could be a booby-trapped uh, PDF, an Adobe Acrobat PDF file. So when somebody clicks, it exploits the software that sits on the desktop. So using these payloads, then the attacker actually gets onto the computer of the individual who fell for the attack. Right. Once that happens, then the attacker works his or her way to other systems on the internal network. That's the scary thing about spear phishing is when we're doing, well, when a hacker tries to break into your company by exploiting like a web application, for example, usually they end up on what we call the DMZ because if you, if you have set up your architecture right, you don't have your systems on your internal network that are facing the internet. But with spear phishing, that's directly targeting the human once their machine is compromised, their desktop, their laptop, that's sitting right on the internal network and gives the attacker much greater visibility into the network. Is that a scary thought or what? And no matter how much money you spend on all this technology, if you spend zero money on your employees, on your training, I'm telling you what happens, what I used to do too, I actually spent a year and a half uh, running all the anti-piracy programs for Microsoft. I did all their technical investigations and uh, went up to Redmond one day. By the way, there are three places in the United States that you got to make sure you're flying to the right place. You know what those are? Redmond, Washington versus Redmond, Oregon. Victoria, um, uh, or, I mean, uh, uh, Vancouver, BC versus Vancouver, Maine. And uh, Portland, Oregon versus Portland, Maine. I'm sorry. So um, I flew into Redmond, Oregon, realizing I needed to then get a buy another ticket to make my meeting the next day. <laughs> and so I show up. She said, don't worry, everybody does it. So I'm sitting there, and they're going, ah, you know, meet us up in level two. We're in uh, building long corporate affairs. Uh, building eight is where Bill Gates was. And they said, well, just meet us up. We'll meet you. We'll come down and get you. We'll meet you up in the second floor room. 
said, I'll meet you there. And I kind of had a deal with him. I said, if I can meet you there, uh, before you get there, I said, you have to double my pay, you know, my rate. They didn't go for that, but I tried anyway. But all I did was I had a collection of badges in there. I watched people walk in. I watched where they held their badges. I looked at the culture, what they did. And then when the next person walked up, I timed up. I said, hey, let you go ahead. Let me get the door for you. I held it open. I walked in. I was in the, I, literally 30 seconds, I was upstairs in the second floor room. It's really not that hard when you, when you just think about what uh, people are susceptible to. So let's talk about uh, this, business email compromise. The FBI really needs to get a marketing arm because business email compromise doesn't sound sexy enough, right? BEC, BEC, business email. Anyway, you know what does that mean? Here's what that means. It means from October 2013 to October 2015, there were 7,066 victims, lost a total of $747 million, uh, and average cost of the uh, loss was 105000 The reason I say that is most business email compromise happens without even clicking on a link. It's like having an entire army surrender without firing a shot. And how does that happen? Spear phishing, reconnaissance, understanding the targets you're going after, understanding the third party payment processors for these guys. So I'll show you about a campaign here done. Well, let's take a look at the, what's happened now. These numbers were just released. Now from October 13 to June of 2016, let's take a look at this. There have now been 22,000 victims, 143, a 313% increase for a total dollar loss right now of $3,086,250,090. Average loss now is $139,000. Are things getting worse or are they getting better? Why are they getting worse? Because we have all this technology. I mean, my God, you've heard from everybody in the room. You know, I used to work at Cisco for seven years, full disclosure. Lots of good stuff there. I've seen Sophos. Why is it that with all of this technology, these things are happening? Because these things are designed to defeat your technology. Human error, human vulnerability. I'm telling you, I quit. here's the one thing I quit doing, I was gonna do it to you guys, but then I realized at the end when I say, hey, here's the free stuff I wanna give you, nobody was signing up for them because they thought I was saying, no, it was gonna be a trick. But one of the things I did is I actually did one of these little things, social engineering. I pulled out, I had a guy deliver me a little sack and say, okay, just come up to me and get a kind of a hot mic thing. Say, did you get it? Yeah, did anybody see it? No, that's good, okay, hold on. And I sent the sack right here. I said, don't worry, this actually belongs to a member of the audience. Then I just leave it and I talked a little bit. I said, is anybody missing like maybe you know a credit card or a phone? No? Okay, that's good. But what would people start doing? Checking. They told me everything I needed to know because I laid the story out, which is I hired a professional pickpocket. Somebody who's one of my colleagues, somebody who actually used to work in the intelligence community, trained in lifting things out of your pocket. Have you seen the videos where the guys can actually remove your watch and your tie? You don't even know it. So if they can do that, trust me, we can get you your credit card. I had everybody doing that. Then at the end, I just pulled out my business card. I said it was truthful. It's actually something that belongs to a member of the audience. I'm a member of the audience. This is my business card. You just now told me and my pickpocket where all of your data is. Then I wondered why nobody wanted to click on the link to sign up, you know, for the free stuff. So I don't do that anymore. So let me tell you about a bunch of rocket scientists. And these are rocket scientists, actually engineers, RF engineers. There's a company called Ubiquity Networks. Ubiquity Networks out of San Jose makes this RF wire. I mean, RF wireless is like the black arts. It's the magic arts. I had guys from Bell Labs working for me at Alcatel Lucent. They, they invented the transistor. You know, they, they're RF wizards. You've got to know your stuff here, right? So, I mean, here's a lot of smart guys. And the owner of the company owns the Memphis Grizzlies. So these got to be smart people, right? You know where we're going with this, right? You know who that is? That's Babai Bear. Babai Bear is waving Babai to $46.7 million from that company because guess what? In a series of three transactions using nothing but email and only wording, they created, they used deception, manipulation, deceit, influence. They got these guys to send $46.7 million to a bank on the eastern edge of China. Oh, you think that's bad? Wait a minute. Now it's hail whale. Let's talk about the big one, right? Oh, wait a second. Ninety-eight million dollars, Southern District of New York. It's the largest business email compromise case to date. How many of you guys want to go in and talk to your boss? Say, hey, boss, we got a little bit of a problem, right, Will? <laughs> good. Good. Hey, you're one of the first thing, you know. Uh, you know. Admit nothing, deny everything, blame somebody else. Yes. Uh, make counter accusations. Don't forget that. That's a good one. Um, me, no, you stole it. I didn't steal it. You know, pretty soon nobody knows this story in the life. Right? So here's the cute stuff. Um, and I have to tell you, I'm a little, I'm a little pissed at Earthbent, and I'm going to tell you why here in a second. Because this was my thing. Your passwords? They stink. Totally stink. What's the most popular password in the United States last year? Password. 
No, negative. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you watched that. See, you watched the video. That was my video. I had that in there. Right? You seen that? And guess what? I was hacked. Somebody <laughs> figured this out. They stole my video. You back there. Wave your hand. Yes. <laughs> So I had to do something else. So here's a little appearance I had on Bill O'Reilly the other night, uh, talking about Colin Powell and his email. The second time Colin Powell's email has been hacked, but it's a much broader question to the Russians. The other security story this evening, hacking into private emails. This week, General Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, was embarrassed when his personal emails surfaced publicly, disparaging both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Based on Washington Morgan Wright, a cybersecurity analyst. So, who do you think hacked into Powell's emails? Uh, all indications point to the Russians. They've had an ongoing campaign against the DNC, you know, the CIA director. Guccifer 2.0 probably has some affiliation. The Russians are very good at doing this, and the tradecraft and the toolkit bill pretty clearly points that it's got to be coming from somewhere in there. When somebody gets hacked like General Powell, the FBI, is that the investigating agency that gets called and goes in and tries to track who's doing it? Yeah, usually they do. That they, they usually have primary responsibility for things like that. Sometimes the Secret Service or DHS will get involved, but on something like this, you'll most likely see so it's FBI an FBI investigation. And there's a pattern of behavior that the Bureau has seen. Yes. Uh, each hacker, uh, Chinese hackers have a pattern, Russian right. hack. And you're saying that you know for a fact that the Powell hack was a profile of a Russian operation. Well, it's, it's hard to put facts in cyberspace. If Russia launches a missile, we can pretty well trace that. That's direct attribution. But like we saw with North Korea, Bill, you know, it took a while to get the facts down. But let's put it this way. Uh, there's more things to indicate that it's Russia than it is anybody else, geopolitically, technically, tradecraft, tools. So could it be just you know, individuals, all things you know, these WikiLeaks people, and could it be individuals that right. are doing this, some guy in their basement? Is that possible? I, I don't think so, Bill, and I'll tell you why. There's a level of sophistication here, a level of rolling things out, a level of understanding political implications to doing this, and the sustained effort, Bill, it took over time to collect these emails. I mean, these things went on for a couple of years. They have over two to three years of emails wow. of General Powell and I other people. That. So, yeah, this is sustained. Yeah, sustained right, so now Powell, Powell gets severely embarrassed, and, and you now everybody in a power position that uses the machines, as I call them, uh, has to worry about being hacked. Is there any way... Yes that folks can protect themselves. Yeah, uh, Bill, you know, if people will just do three basic things. Number one, encrypt every piece of data you have at rest or in motion. Number two, use a better password, use a stronger password, and there's some things out there uh, built a course around to do that. Third thing is it's called multi-factor authentication. It's like a username and a password, then either a security key or a token that recycles every 30 seconds. If you would just do those three basic things, you would be better than 98% of the people computing in the United That's States right now. Those three things. Okay. Texting. That's not the same as email. Can you hack into no. texting? Yes, you can. Now, you look at the. Uh, there's a protocol called SS7. Doesn't mean you know it's a geeky thing, but that that thing was hacked. That's the thing that basically runs all the cell phones around the world. So if you can get to an email, you can get to a cell phone, you can get to a text, and with Apple and iCloud and storing things like that, there's a lot of things you can get to. People don't realize. <laughs> you see, there's no privacy in the world anymore. There really isn't any privacy uh, anymore. This encryption, I, don't I guess, know, is you're the somewhere in Alaska. Yeah, you know, go to Alaska somewhere away from all the cell yeah, towers. You yeah. might come right. close. All right. <laughs> Mr. Wright, we appreciate it. Thanks very much. Beach Boys on deck. Sorry, right. you don't get to see the Beach Boys. You know. uh, we'll see uh, you know, Barbara in here in a minute. But uh, the point about it is that was the second time Colin Powell had been hacked. You know how he got hacked the first time? Lucifer did it, the original Lucifer. You know how he hacked him? He read his biography. In that biography, he talked about his grandmother and his grandmother's name. What was Colin Powell's password for his email on AOL? Oh, grandmother's name. Who else did we hear that from in the video, right? It's my grandmother's name. What's a good Italian grandmother's name? Maria. Oh, I just gave you my password. Yeah. No dust, you're locked. Um, and why you would ever say some of that. I don't, I, by the way, I'm, I'm on the record. I don't believe the guy from Israel. That was all made up. I think he was just having fun. But anyway, that being said, why does this happen? People are confused, you're lazy, or they're not doing the basic things like that. Anybody know what that is besides two locks? I know you're going to say that, well, I mean, a blank, blinding flash of the obvious, but I want to help you out. Where are those two locks located, though? Who said that? Who said what? No, those aren't hard drives. No, that's a submarine. That's called a sealed authenticator system. Come on, you guys have watched Red October, right? You can't launch missiles without, and, you know, uh, Alabama Crimson Tide, right? 
You can't launch things without getting an authorization from the National Command Authority on a message that comes in, uh, the e-lint message that comes in. You have to have the code. You have to break it open. They have to agree that it's authenticated. They get their cues. They open it up. The launch codes are inside there, right? You can't launch nuclear missiles without two-factor authentication. So why are we still using email that has two-factor authentication to us and we're not taking advantage of it? It's laziness. That's all it is. It's pure laziness or you don't know, you don't care, or again, it's Vegas, baby. Ashley Madison hack. I mean, brilliant marketing, right? Uh, 40 million passwords are hacked out of those. 11 million were analyzed. What was the most popular password in Ashley Madison? <laughs> Howard, I have a solution for you. This is your new password. You ready? You know, I have the rainbow and everything. I want to make it happy. It's a happy password, right? This is all you have to type in now. E10ABC3949BA59ABBE56E057F20FAA3D, right? Very simple, right? You guys, how many of you guys want to type that? You know what's easier to type? This, because that's what 123456 is, right? So how do you change that? I'm going to tell you. Fourth thing I want to talk about, do you get this? Four? Get it? Four? Golf? Golf ball? I told you, this thing is, I, I got clever stuff built around this. I can't, I can't believe you guys haven't saw, I mean, I spent hours just on this one slide, just getting it right. Two popular things that I'm very concerned about, uh, malware and ransomware. You guys have heard about ransomware. Um, malicious software, you know, and ransomware. The reason I'm concerned about ransomware is that we still have people clicking on links and installing ransomware, and thanks to brilliant people like the Hollywood Presbyterian, um, and I'll show you that case here in a second. Um, this is the most, uh, in, in how they changed the dynamic of it. This is the most popular way it's introduced, right? Phishing and spear phishing. How else do you get ransomware? Somebody call you up and say, hey, you'd like to install ransomware on your server? No problem. Hey, here's our you know, you know, username, password, sysadmin stuff. You just got to make sure you log in. Right? Nobody does that. How do they do it? They do it through email. How do they get your emails? They see you at conferences. You post stuff on LinkedIn. Hey, I was just at this conference. Hey, I was just at this conference too, it. Hey, what did you think about that? Hey, by the way, here's that paper Sopo said about how to protect against threats. Boom, and I send you a PDF. What do you do on it? Ah, it's a problem. You say, you've been trained now. You say, no, I never opened anything sent like that. <laughs> Fail. Well, Facebook that. <laughs> Hollywood Presbyterian. Let's talk about the state of security of, of healthcare right now. They are the number one target. Congratulations, who's in healthcare here? Why'd you raise your hand? <laughs> Get that guy's email. What's your name? <laughs> All right. What changed? Well, actually, here's a better picture. Let's everybody thinks health, you know, Hollywood Presbyterian, right? What happened with them is what dynamic changed in that one incident was the level of payment. They asked for $2 million of Bitcoin. Brilliant negotiators, they settled though for $17,000. Still, what was the average ransomware before that? Three to $500 maybe. You've just now changed the bar on what everybody else now has to pay for successful ransomware payment. Thank you, Hollywood Press Material. I can tell you that if, well, actually, uh, I'm gonna tell you, let me show you this one. This one now, here's the other thing that concerns me. This is about cyber terrorism. Uh, you guys familiar with the black energy attack that happened in Ukraine, December? 800,000 homes taken out? Let me show you this and I'll tell you about this. I can tell you that if the power goes out, you will have this cascading things that will tax our uh, health care, that will tax emergency response, 911, you know, utilities. So, yeah, this is, this is a series of dominoes. Do you believe that we'd be able to come back online in a half a day or a day or so? I don't think so. You look at what happened in Ohio that one time, how long things were out, even New York. I think we were so interdependent. I think it may be in a small area, but on a big scale, no. Morgan Wright was on our show last week talking about what would happen here if we experienced a power outage like the one that impacted tens of thousands of people in western Ukraine over the holidays. It was the first successful type of black energy hack attack on a major power plant. And officials there are blaming the situation on Russian hackers. And now, just over the last 24 hours, U.S. Homeland Security has identified what happened and is now saying it was a type of cyber attack. And it's connecting to spear phishing, which we're going to talk about in just a more a moment. Morgan Wright's back with us. And here we are, Morgan. So this is chapter two, or, or maybe three or four, in, uh -huh. in what happened in Ukraine over the holidays that really raised uh, an alert right. around the world. So what do you think of what the Department of Homeland Security is now saying about what they're going to do about this? 
Jenna, then you talk about the timing. I just did a, a, a product launch video for a company called Cloudmark. I got to interview the world's most famous hacker, Kevin Mitnick. We talked about if you could pick one tool and tactic, what would it be? Spear phishing. And now we know from DHS, spear phishing was the method of intrusion through a corrupted Word document. And the fact that they were able to take control of this so fast, so quickly, and then at the same time, Jenna, uh, do a denial of service attack against the call center. People couldn't call in to tell the call center, hey, my power's out. So this really extended wow. the impact and length of it. Now, last week we were talking about black energy malware and saying that's right. what caused this and what makes this so dangerous, just in case our viewers miss the segment, is that this sort of malware gets into your system and you say it hides. Right. It's hard to find. So it was Absolutely. able to enter the system through what could be what looks like a normal email to me and I click on the wrong thing yep. and boom. And this is what makes this stuff so scary. I mean, people are still the weakest link in cybersecurity, Jenna. Uh, you know, people click on things they shouldn't do. People download files they shouldn't do. And this is a perfect example of how easy it is to break into things is that you don't have to break through the window. You simply ask for the key. The key is click on this link. And so in that document was the malware that allowed them then to download the full package of black energy, hide inside those systems, which, by the way, is happening here in the United States, too. Let's not kid ourselves for one minute. We are as much as risk as the Ukraine is. And then at a moment, and a time and a moment of their choosing, they will launch the attack, and we're going to be responding to it once again. So what do you think is the effectiveness of the Department of, uh, Department of Homeland Security now being involved? What can they do and how can they help? I think of it as a crime scene. When I was a detective, you, know, you go out to the crime scene, you know, what happened, let's collect evidence, let's see what happened, and learn some lessons from this. So I know they're very interested right now in the tradecraft. How did this happen? How can we look for signatures so that we can now build a tool to scan our own critical infrastructure and look to find out where this black energy malware is hiding? I think that's one of the biggest takeaways, but the fact that they're over there tells you about the seriousness of this threat. If it was a low-level threat, DHS wouldn't be involved. they just go send us the report. The fact that they're disengaged should cause concern for people in this country. We're watching this very closely because, as we mentioned, we know this malware is in our system, right. so it only takes one more, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it only takes one email, one click, and then suddenly Absolutely. it can be activated. And here we are in winter. What does that mean if we had a, a big power outage like we saw in Ukraine? Just before I let you go, Morgan, since you talked to the you know top hacker in the world, I'm just wondering, is there anything else we should know <laughs> about your conversation? Are we all safe just because we know you, that he's not going to try to hack us? I mean, what, what, what else no, did you no, no. Okay. from that conversation. Kevin was a good guy. Him and I got along very famously. It's funny because we're like we're like uh, the odd couple. I used to teach guys that were the guys that went out and caught him originally when he was on the FBI top 10. But one thing you can learn, it's, again, it goes back to the way he would do it and I would do it. If I had one tool to pick, I would go after people, not the technology. I can always get in and I will always be successful when I go after the people in an organization. So be careful about that. I never send you links in an email, Jenna, so don't worry about it's clicking true. on it. You don't. I appreciate that, Morgan. It's, it's hard. At this point, I don't want to click on it anything. Uh, but we'll be watching what DHS gets from this investigation and where it goes next. It's great to have you back on the program. Thank you. You bet, John. Got it. The lesson out of that is uh, an Israeli Air Force general who's since retired actually has a very famous saying in terms of uh, order of battle, preparation for intelligent preparation of the battlefield. If you want to bring a nation to its knees, you want to bring a nation to its knees, what two things do you go after? Power and, well, actually, you're right, communications third. But the two things that cause civil unrest more than anything else is power and water. If I want to disrupt emergency response and things like that, you're right. I go, I go after communication. It's the things uh, with the Iraq war and things like that. Um, you go after the build command and control is based upon communication, your ability to collaborate with other people. But if I wanted, if I just wanted to go after two things in every nation, I could bring a nation to its knees. I'd go after the power of the water. How bad would things get after a wall where there's no power? And it's by the way, there's only one place uh, on the Fahrenheit and Celsius temperature scale to where the temperature means the exact same thing in both Fahrenheit and Celsius. You guys are in South Dakota, you ought to know what this one is. Minus 40. Minus 40, very good, what's your name? Matthew, go back and get yourself one of those free bottles of Pepsi or something. <laughs> <laughs> and a cookie, anybody get this bad cookie here too. Um, you need some sugar, you need some sugar. I see you got Mountain Dew, are you an engineer? Right code? What do you do? Your student? No, well just, Watch that Mountain Dew, man. <laughs> so, but my point is, is that uh, minus 40 is the only place. Can you imagine if your power went out here for a sustained period of time at minus 40, what starts happening to water pipes at minus 40? What will burst? Absolutely. What happens when the power goes, you know, this happened because somebody clicked on a frickin' link that down, you know, from a, a, a Microsoft Word attachment. That was a macro in there that delivered the payload that took over an entire energy station. 
Imagine what they could do if they were real serious. Here's why people do it. How many of you guys are Star Trek fans? So the first gen or the real ones or second, first gen or the next one, the next generation ones? Real. The original ones, right? Well, here's here's one that'll here's why people respond to email, and I've watched some of you. Captain. Incoming message. Oh, that's a little loud. That's okay, that just keeps you awake, right? What happens when we get an email? I've seen you guys do this. Right? You think people are praying, right? Before, I know it's the Midwest, I came from Kansas, right? You think people are praying, and then they reach up and they've got their phone in their hand and they're actually texting or replying to an email, right? They're not praying before dinner, they're reading before dinner, they're praying that there's not a message they have to respond to. Uh, but that's what happens. We get, we, get, we get that Pavlov response, we get a link, we have to answer it, right? You feel that urgency, right? How many of you guys got the I'm telling you now, you, how many of you guys are thinking out, I gotta, if I can just sneak my phone out, I can actually look at an email, right? Or a text message. How many of you guys are old school? How many of you guys like Monty Python? Oh, yeah. Who is this for you, then? Okay, let me turn that down. There we go. That's what happens. We get, we get used to this. I, I love Monty Python, too. But message, right? You hear that thing? One of the biggest productivity wasters besides, you know, solitary used to be on Microsoft Windows, right? Is you hear the email ding or your phone would go off. It would buzz. And what does everybody do? They did a study. I think it was uh, Pew Research did a study. What does the average millennial check their phone how many times a day? Like over 70 or something? Over 100? Buzz, you're looking. You're nodding your head. You're, you're guilty of that, aren't you? What's your name, Jared? Are you addicted to your iPhone or Android? Not, oh, no, I'm not addicted. I can handle it. You know? <laughs> I don't need to. I can handle this. You know? I'm responsible. I know how to text responsibly. All right. This is what happens when you get ransomware, right? Now they got you. What are you going to do? So you click on these things, they'll hold you hostage, right? Here's a, here's a sobering thing. Why do they go? Why is healthcare such an inviting target? It's, it's economics, folks. It's capitalism. Milton Friedman told us. The average credit card work record is worth 50 cents. Right now, you're looking at health care records that are worth anywhere from 50 to $70 and even higher. Why? Because one is actually identity fraud. I steal your credit card number. That's not identity theft. It's identity fraud. Your name is matched to a payment number, which is that credit card number. That's why it's only worth 50 cents. But what does your health care record have in it? Name, address, date of birth, usually social security number, dependents, your Medicare, Medicaid, you know, uh, healthcare information in there. So that's why it's worth. These are these are the golden eggs, and that's what they want. So the fifth thing, who's the problem? <laughs> you are. I'm sorry, hey, to break this to you, well, you're about to cry now, aren't you? Uh, no? Okay. But you guys, no, really, people are the problem. You can build all the technology you want, right? We built safer cars, right? But we still have accidents. All right, we put airbags in cars. How many of you guys are willing to hop in a Tesla self-driving car now? Oh. <laughs> you, give me your badge. You can go now. What's your Josh? Josh, all right, Josh. Well, Josh. Oh, sorry, Josh. It says Josh for there, but he goes, is that your stage name? <laughs> all right, Josh. Well, Josh, no, I, if you guys didn't know, actually, if you catch me tomorrow, I think I'll be on uh, Happening Now. We're going to do a segment. Two and a half years ago, I talked about they, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. They said, could Al-Qaeda really hack your car? I said, you know, you can't be at that point. You had to be physically close to it. There's some things you can manipulate. I said, but don't forget. This is what I said. Believe me now, in Malaysia, as Honnold said. Um, I said, I talked about Tesla. What did Tesla have even two and a half, three years ago built into it? They had a 3G modem. It had an IP address. They, that's how they downloaded their firmware and their stats every night and the vehicle uh, telemetry and stuff like that. So guess what happened now? Tesla, from 12 miles away... Chinese, well, Chinese research, that's kind of a misnomer. Uh, it was Chinese military under the name of Tencent. It sounds like a Chinese rapper. We have 50 cents, they have Tencent. That was the name of it. <laughs> but so here's Safety Squirrel. What does Safety Squirrel say? He's just like, just stop it. Stop the madness. Quit doing this stuff. Quit clicking on links. Quit plugging in USBs. Quit downloading files you shouldn't. Quit visiting sites <clears throat> you shouldn't, especially on work computers. Why? Because those things are loaded with uh, things that will do, um, uh, you know, click jacking. It'll do. It'll introduce malicious software. You got job outlets that are able to just embed things into you without you even knowing it. Right? Here's the thing: if we don't do this, it's like Groundhog Day. We're going to keep repeating this over and over and over again. So how do we stop this? If you don't stop this, this is what will happen. This is like the field of broken dreams. You wanted to build your big business. You want that you're in a university. You're in government. You want to provide services. You want to build Earthbend up to a, you know a billion dollar company. Doesn't happen. If you guys don't learn just a few lessons. Here's one of the lessons. Here's what, who you think you are. A lot of you. And I'm looking at some of you engineers in the room. How many of you guys think you're like elite? You're ninja. 
You know what I mean? I'm like, give me a balaclava and a and a, one of those ninja swords, man, I can take it on. Here's the real problem. This is what most people think they are. This is how the hackers view you. <laughs> you are the colonial army with musket loaders. You are outgunned, outmatched. Why? Because you're trying to defend against. You're trying to build that wall high against everything. They're only looking for the one vulnerability, and that's all they spend their time on. That's it. That one vulnerability, that one buffer overflow, that one um, uh, exception you know, in the code that's going to allow them to get access to information. You know, zero day exploits. So this is this. So this is the real serious thing. So what can we do? Yes, we can do it. Here's the things that we can do together. Number one, quit being the bait for phishing and spear phishing. Quit clicking on links. You got to do a little bit of Sherlock Holmes here. Investigate this stuff. Number two, quit using sucky passwords. I'm telling you right now. Remember, how, you guys remember how Mark Zuckerberg got hacked on his Twitter account? It's because he used the same stupid password four years ago on LinkedIn that he used for his Twitter account. And he got hacked. Now, how can you solve that? Here's how you do it. It's very simple. It's formula. You want a strong password? This looks like it's complicated and it's math, right? So I'm going to pick on somebody new. Let's see. Uh, you, ma'am, right there. What's your name? I'm sorry? Oh, don't, don't be ashamed of your name. What is it? Katie? Katie? Okay. Katie, what's your favorite food? Pizza. Pizza is Katie's favorite food. So here's what we're going to do. My favorite food is pizza, right? Can you remember that now? Will you forget your favorite food is pizza? So, and actually, guys, everything I'm showing you, at the end, you can, I'll give you the links and everything. I'll give it to Jess and Joe. You guys can download all this stuff. I actually have a password course built. It's about 15 minutes long, four videos, a worksheet. I'm going to show you how to create a password. It'll be 100% every time. You can have a separate password for every single site that you log into, and you'll never forget it. Here's how to do it. My favorite food is pizza. How many words in my favorite food is pizza? It's not a trick question. Five. Very good, Will. Five. It went five, we would have had to talk. <laughs> so what's that? So I'm just giving you the basic, right? Because if you go back to this formula, x, y is the number, a special character, and then a numerical representation of the number of words in your passphrase. And then just simple, uppercase, lowercase. M, Y, F, A, F, O, I, S, P, I. F, A stands for Facebook. T, W would stand for Twitter. Uh, D, R would stand for Dropbox. A, M would stand for Amazon. I can, I can teach, and, and you can have a separate password for every single site. All you have to do is remember my favorite food is pizza. Out of that, you'll figure out, oh, there's five words in that, and what site am I logging into? It's very simple. It scores 100% at passwordmeter.com every single time. What's that? Does somebody have a good comment? Or? All right, steal my thunder. Give a cookie. All right. Here's why. Here's the other thing you need to use, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. How many of you right now, as a matter of business practice, require the use of two-factor authentication? I do not see enough hands going up in this room. This is, I'm telling you, that's why on Bill O'Reilly I said there's three things you can do. Number one is encrypt everything, data at rest, data in motion. Number two is multi-factor authentication. There's a difference between two-factor, two-step verification, and multi-factor. But whatever it is, you've got to have a second, because uh, right now there's a little app called Google Authenticator. How many of you guys know about Google Authenticator? Okay, I see a lot of hands going up. You know about it. I saw very few hands going up saying you used it. So yeah, well, yeah, there's the RSA token. I get that, but there's things that you can do. If you will just, if Colin Powell, by the way, John Brennan, the director of the Central Intelligence, um, got his AOL account hacked. What? Who in God's name uses AOL as a secure email account? <laughs> and AOL is in my county, in Bob County. So in that email, John Brennan's email that they got into because they social engineered the password actually out of Verizon and some other folks, reset his account password, was a spreadsheet listing 12 senior people that were going to go visit. I visited the White House before the executive office. Anytime you go down there when you hold a security clearance, you have to provide your name, date of birth, address, social security number, because they have to vet you and check you, even if you have a security clearance. So in that are 12 people, senior people, all of their information is exposed, all of his information is exposed, and a copy of his standard form 86. Anybody in here ever been in the military or held a security clearance? A standard form 86 is when they take a microscope, and I won't tell you where they go with that microscope, but trust me, it's not comfortable, and they ask you questions about everything from the time you were born and why you knocked, the, why, you, why you pulled the little girl's pigtails in second grade, you know, to now. And so he had that in his AOL account. I mean, brilliant, right? I mean, here's a guy in charge of central intelligence. <laughs> Apparently one of those words is contradictory. <laughs> Number three, stop, think, don't click that link. Why? Because most of the time, it's a trap. Get it? Mouse trap? Mouse trap. <laughs> I told you, this is clever stuff. I, 
I mean, it's, I don't know where you guys are going to go in Sioux Falls to get this kind of entertainment for free. So. <laughs> Number four, here's an important one, though. Empower, you can't just can't empower people. You have to, and this is going to be one of my degrees is human resource management, so I say this from both sides of this. You've got to hold people accountable. You give them responsibility and authoritability. Uh, along with that comes accountability. So responsibility and authority, you have to hold them accountable. That means in the military right now in the Pentagon, they've actually started moving forward to where they are now court-martialing people or doing what they call Article 15. If you've been given training on not to click links that introduce malicious software into a federally owned system, a system of federal interest, and you click on a link and it ends, they are going to, you will at, at a minimum get a Article 15, which is a loss of grade, loss of pay, or you'll be court-martialed, and if you're a civilian, you'll be fired. That's how serious they're taking it. And I'm not saying that you go out and publicly flog people, put them in stocks, and make fun of them. Because uh, I don't even believe in South Dakota you're allowed to do that, you know, as an employee benefit. Um, <laughs> I mean, that would be fun every now and then, wouldn't it? Yeah, right? Here's why, though. Because you still need you still need to have somebody, you know, back behind them. Give them the power, but hold them accountable, right? Give them the training. Do everything, but then you have to hold them accountable for results. It's just like sales. How many people here are involved in sales? Right? Say all you want, right? But at the end of the day, what matters? <coughs> Accountability. Did you hit your number? Did you make your number? You know, did we do what we're supposed to do? Don't care how you do it, but did you do it? So you have to have some accountability. Fifth thing, training is like bathing. You know why? Neither one is permanent, and you can usually tell when it hasn't been done in a while, right? How many people sat on the plane next to one of those people? Been, you know, been in a restaurant, and you say, whoa, you know, that halibut is ripe today. You know? But that's, you can't just say, oh, we did our yearly training. Why? Because then in a month, guess what? You forget it, right? So you got to constantly train. So let me leave you with this. You know, make, just make sure you do constant training. So here's what I'm going to do. Got a couple giveaways. Here's a parting gift. Don't worry. Um, you can write it down here. There's no tricks involved. I'm not scamming you. The only thing I ask is for an email for a couple reasons. Number one, I have a book coming out. It's called Identity Predators, Win the War Against Hackers, Scammers, and Thieves. So if you're on the list, when it comes out for the first two days, the book's going to be free. So you'll be able to download it from Amazon for free. So here's what here's all you have to do. You can either do this or you can text. Now, um, I have some... I had some uh, guys in law enforcement, and I love them because that's what I did, but they they were trying to text 44222 to Earthbend. No, text Earthbend to the number 44222, right? Don't do it the other way around. You'll get some kind of error, and uh, something will happen to your phone, and if you have a Samsung Galaxy, apparently it catches on fire. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go to this URL, identitysecurity.com slash Earthbend, out there. Again, I'll, I'll be up front. The only thing I ask for is an email. And what I'll give you is not only I'll give you that, and the link will be the link to my password course. It'll be the link to that guide. You can download it for free, uh, use it, uh, share it with your friends, and you'll be on the line. If, if you need to reach me or if I can be of help, uh, there you go. If you can't find me on the Internet, you are not trying hard enough, we will take away your Windows or your Mac. Now, if you're a Mac user, you should be able to find me. Windows might have to do a little training, right? You Mac or Windows? Linux, Linux you're okay, right? Hey, if you guys ever want to know how to sound arrogant, ask a Unix administrator. <laughs> so last lesson, remember when, I, when we started this off, what's the one thing I said you always have to do? Operate from a system yeah, what? Shields up. So keep your shields up, do those things. So hey, I've got just a couple minutes. If there's any quick questions, I don't want to steal from the next person. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, drives, pitches, loans, anything I said about today? <laughs>